Yeah. So we're going to do a little bit of non, you know, just presentation-y stuff in a little bit, but I'm curious um, of folks here, what are some of the things that you use in a social context that are open source and social meaning just like you interact with other people? Everything, but what are they? What are they? Matrix, Matrix. yeah. <laughs> Just matrix and full stop. So they rent to type friend they're on non boss stuff. Mm -hmm. I do three transitions of that. Yeah. What Android? 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 Yeah. Uh you know. I mean, I guess you could say everything made with a React would be up I don't know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, what? Thunderbird for email. Thunderbird for email. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Signal. Yep. We're gonna have probably some debating about Signal in here. Um. Cool. Well. Well. Yeah. I'll give it. I'll get started. So, hi everyone. I'm LX. Um, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about sustainable pro-social digital infrastructure which is like a lot of sort of too many syllable words for something that's basically how do we uh, have something that where we are supported to be with each other online um, in non-terrible ways and actually have it be something that can last so um, first to give you a, a just a, a sense of what pro social pro social is kind of like an academic e term, um, but what is pro social technology? Um, and so the way that we think about it, this is that it is technology that can not just be neutral, maybe, but even like lean a little bit towards cultivating behavior that benefits society or or the collective, um, encourages respectful interaction considers possible harms and accessibility for people who are on the margins, supports cohesion and long-term relationships, does not exploit human vulnerability or extract in service or profit of, or growth, and accommodates human flourishing as we could loosely define as UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, Again, this is this is my take, so feel free to disagree when we talk more. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about where we are now in the world of social technologies. So as evidence here, there's just all kinds of um, all kinds of problems ranging from, you know, things around speech, around uh, misinformation to, you know, harassment. So many, many problems. And how did we get here? Well, um, guess what? It's often a question about money. So um, in most of our uh, social technologies, we have VC backing and sort of a free model uh, for consumers and so, or users, or, I hate all of these words, um, for people who are using the thing. And so that leads, um, when we try to get to like an uh, exit, from a for a VC, they they put their money in at um, you know one valuation, and they're hoping that it will come back a hundred times valuable, more valuable. Um, so then that leads people who are building the products to create the products in ways that actually are pretty antisocial. Um, this is enhanced by an advertising business model. So you know when you have an advertising business model, then it, um, you're looking for high growth usually. Um, if you charge for a service, then typically that slows down growth and that in the world of uh, social technology is often like, oh, we can't have slow growth. That would reduce network effects and so then it will fail. Um, and there's some reality to this, right? If, as we were talking about before we got started, um, when everybody uses something, then it's very hard to get other people to migrate to something new. But of course, that has all kinds of 
of challenges and baked into advertising. So, um, you know, you are the product and you start seeing the way that even people just are naturally behaving is basically like an advertisement. So um, not only do you have to see advertisements, but you yourself become like the marketer of you. Um, and then of course, in the world of proprietary software, there's usually this like um, monopolistic tendency. So, you know, we don't have people making interoperability based products. We are trying to like win at all costs, um, even like don't even have to be profitable quite a lot of the time um, for lengthy periods of time in the early stages of a VC backed uh, company because if you are spending money to get growth and it's working, then by all means, you know, um, use it to shut down your competitors. And uh, it's just, you know, very antisocial, even in that context as well. Now, when we talk about um, the another aspect of this and uh, is the short term focus. So when we talk about how things are funded, a lot of investment-based funding is looking for a return in a, in a certain period of time. And that's very natural because most of the money that they are distributing to software companies is coming to them at a limited time. So they have to return it or else be kind of on the hook for that. Um, but that lead, means that we can't grow things at a trustful speed. Um, and then really like everything that we're talking about in terms of measuring the problems in this space are also very short term. So like things like um, the long term cultural health are not things that these companies are are using as metrics. Um, and then there's just this question around resource allocation. So when you are a company that's funded by a VC, then you're just going to basically pay engineers <laughs> and uh, maybe like not so much think about the the sort of more people oriented or um, the the trust and safety aspects, those are going to be um, things that are not prioritized in the money that you're spending. So, um, and, you know, some of these things may or may not apply as much to open source um, just in fundamental ways, but this is the, sort of the thing that's happened with these proprietary softwares. And so, um, a lot of when when I say uh, open source software doesn't offer a moat, uh, it's not just in terms of the design of these platforms, but it's also in terms of the data use of the platform. So most proprietary uh, companies that are um, proprietary software companies in this space are really mostly like just sucking in data and using that as um, currency even things like Discord or, or something like that that are not like a public social media, um, they're not making money, but they are getting a lot of data about people. Um, and then, you know, the last thing that happens in this context is really just like a lack of responsibility. And I think this is something um, that probably could, ex you know, you could argue exist as well in some ways for open source software um, that's social. So like things like uh, Mastodon, for example, um, there's now you're responsible as a server owner. Um, so there is responsibility, but there's there's like a very gray area and, and certainly the platforms um, are trying to m keep legislators from uh, enforcing any kind of responsibility. Um, so you know, there's just a, a lack of protection for people who are using these products. Uh, I asked Claude about this, um, <laughs> just for fun. And, uh, and Claude said um, that no funding model is perfect, but diversifying away from a pure commercial VC backed model could introduce some checks against the worst societal excesses we've seen. A mix of models pursuing different incentives may produce better outcomes. And um, gosh, you know, maybe we need to put AI in charge of snow. But, uh, but you can see that open source and community governed is one of the suggestions that um, Claude has for 
making um, for funding models that would be better for us uh, as a sort of collective whole. So the, a part of the thing that happens with um, in the world of Silicon Valley is that we have this situation and it's quite different than open source typically. So in Silicon Valley, people go out and raise money, often on an idea or like very early stage product where there's no even sureness that that thing is wanted by anybody, um, but it's a good like pitch. It's a good sell to the investors. And, you know, a lot of that also has to do with who's doing the pitching and who's doing the investing. So there's kind of like a closed loop in that way as well. Um, and so, you know, we think about what happens in like by contrast in open source is it's often something that, you know, one or a few people come together to build, um, but they're doing it usually like part time or um, there's no resources for doing things like um, developing an ecosystem and, you know, documentation, that kind of thing for some time, right? Uh, it involves like really creating a center of gravity around something that works before you get a lot of attention and, and then people coming in to contribute. Um, and one of the problems that just in general in open source that we're all aware of is that um, open source has an accessibility problem because, you know, if you have to keep a job or two jobs in order to just live, um, where do you have time to contribute to things that may be good for the world, but, you know, can't support you? Um, so this is when we come into the issue of how do we have alternative visions for social and social interactive products that don't come out of this model? And, um, you know, open source, I, I believe, is a really important piece of this puzzle. And there's still some of the same systemic issues around like, how do we build things that are actually um, appropriate for people who are not simply the, the people who we currently have in our open source ecosystem. Um, yeah, and, and so people who are just trying to build um, you know, there's a, there's a certain like level of high bar for just the technical aspects of, of building an open source that, um, so we don't really have like no code that is also can be an open source, um, which is weird. I mean, that I, I'm open to being argued with on that, but right now it feels uh, pretty hard. So what we want is ideally to have um, social technology that is open source, community co-designed, and this is really important. So like um, in a lot of open source projects, there's maybe people who are using the product and they are con they might be involved in the co-design, but the the people who we actually like want to include um, beyond just people in the open source community are often not included. And a lot uh, and that means that you know large, um, populations of people who are important um, and maybe don't fit like the Western uh, sort of, I, I don't want to tar open source with too much of a diversity problem, but there, you know, we, we lack a, uh, um, room there's room for improvement. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so we want to be able to serve individual small groups and communities rather than just businesses. So this is another thing where like, you know, someone mentioned matrix and there's a lot in this space that's kind of like, okay, the business model, we can, it can be for your groups and communities, but there's a business model that's business focused. Um, and that is great, but it maybe limits the amount of um, types of products that can be in this space in open source. Uh, we want it to be, possible to self-host, um, but not required. We want privacy, obviously. Um, we want adequate moderation tools. We want excellent UX. Um, that's a really important thing for being able to bring people who are non-technical to use the product. Accessible, um, again, similar, but also, you know, the various things that are necessary for people who are um, not 
uh, or people who have different ex kinds of accessibility needs. And then um, one thing that we also want is probably to design it so that it reduces possible harms. So when, um, yeah, come back to that. Uh, so in open source, you know, the these are some of the challenges that we have um, that in most sort of startup world in social, it's we're not just building a tech, we are building an ecosystem of people using the product. And that is usually something that requires, um, you know, being able to get to a certain level of finished before people actually use the product to you know, um, the amount of uh, discomfort that people are willing to bear will be sort of relative to their alternatives. And when you have alternatives that are completely free and have massive amounts of money, um, then, you know, this is a challenge. Uh, we often don't see a lot of UX and community co-design in open source. Um, I think that's maybe changing, but, you know, it's, it's still something that I think a lot of projects, um, could put more emphasis on. And then generating a maintainer uh, population, it just takes time and, and people kind of going out and recruiting and or spreading the word. Um, the, the lack of diversity that we mentioned, and then just the sustainability of maintaining the project. So um, we're gonna get to this. So there are success stories, but like, for example, Mastodon did not have an employee other than Eugen till this year. And so that's, you know, like how do you sustain something that millions of people are now using with one developer? It's pretty hard. Um, so we have these other kind of success stories of how of projects that are in the space that I think are, um, you know, well used open source alternatives in the social space and also um, use different mechanisms to fund them. So um, I'll just go through a little bit. So Matrix, um, in addition to having gotten some grants in the beginning, also has a lot of procurement um, funding it. Um, Proton um, was, you know, has has a various things and now are a foundation, as probably you know. Um, Signal again. Not all are FOSS, but uh, Signal was funded by having somebody who has a lot of money putting it in. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of these, but they're, they're interesting different ones. So Ghost, for example, was crowdfunded. Um, you have something like Discourse, which is like totally VC company. Um, and so there's many different models of how things get funded. Um, Discourse does have DC funding. Oh yes. Discourse? No. Dis Discourse is. Oh yeah, they, they have. They've ra raised, I think, three rounds. Yeah. And now they have a twenty million round. Oh, um, it was uh, in twenty one. Oh, it was oh. Yeah, they've raised quite a lot of DC. Yeah, Lumio came out of um, being in Spiral, and so they they were kind of building for themselves in a way, kind of like Slack, I guess, in the beginning, and then realized, oh, this could be a product. Um, so in Spiral is kind of like a cooperative network. Um, yeah, yeah, really, really diverse ways of doing this. So some of the some of these different ways that people are funding open source social tools I mentioned VC um, usually VCs in this space are are investing in um, technologies that are b2b because it's just like social for consumers is a notoriously terrible kind of investment space um, although strangely that's also where some of the biggest money is in the world I don't know it's a weird thing um, and so then there's crowdfunding grants um, so you know, these these require different entity structures around the the people who are being paid. Um, Co-design. So this is like, an, you know, there's a, a thing called Hilo where they are um, using grants with communities to get the grants and then they'll sort of build features for them. 
um, procurement, which I mentioned, um, corporate developer sponsorship. So this is like, well, as you know, um, sometimes you might be able to convince a, uh, a corporation for them to pay their developers or, or other developers to work on something. Um, and then big donors like Signal. We're also seeing new things coming out. So um, bottom-up funding, this is things like um, a consumer co-op or having sort of individual donors, um, which has been around for a while, but I think there's sort of more infrastructure now for it. I mean, Open Collective is now doing a, a crowdfunding redesign. So that's sort of an indication that that's becoming more of a thing. Um, public funding, some flavor of tokenizing, meaning like there's Web3 kinds of approaches people are trying. Um, and then sort of a crazy idea, which I don't think has happened, but there's some discussion around is this idea of some kind of um, like holding company kind of ecosystem thing so that it would be funding things that are interoperable and also can create kind of by a combination of a lot of small projects, something that is maybe competitive with the bigger players in the social space. And then maybe, what got any others that I don't have on here? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say briefly that this is the start of a full track today on economics and different speakers and different sessions are going to continue building on this to even talk about potentials or other things that exist or stats. On, so I, I, I don't want to like, say what all the other talks are going to all do, but they, they actually are, are continuing this exact topic. Amazing. Excellent. Uh, someone else has something? I don't know. Okay. Um, so let's, we're going to have a little discussion. So this is a question around what you've seen working to sustain open source pro-social tech. And uh, we're going to actually do start by group breaking up into groups of two or three. And I'm going to hand out some papers to take some notes. Oh, thank you, Salt. Mm. Yeah, so just find someone next to you um, and talk with them. I know. You were like, no, we've got to get out of here. I Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, try to try to wrap up, and we're gonna come back and share some of what we discovered here. So maybe like just wrap up your conversations. 
And if, if you can hear me, raise your hand. Ah, wonderful. Kindergarten for the win. Yes. Uh, awesome. So um, coming back into the larger group, I'm curious to just hear maybe like one takeaway from each group. Um, maybe like what you t what the technology you talked about was and one thing about it that was either anti-social, pro-social and or sustainable, non-sustainable. The thing that you found the most interesting. Okay, so we'll start over here. We talked about matrix. Matrix. Um, it's not currently sustainable. <laughs> and I, I guess one, one interesting kind of anti social thing is that it, it got a lot of its popularity by bridging with IRC. Mm, yeah. It doesn't really have the resources or, or whatever to maintain the IRC bridge to the standards that like the Webara chat people want them to. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's kind of got some users and then now it's broken that bridge and doing its own thing. Yeah, really important and interesting. So did everyone hear that? I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to repeat it for the recording or something. But yeah, so Matrix, um, because of the way that it is funded is unsustainable, and in particular that um, its bridge with IRC can't really be maintained to the correct standards or wanted standards. And so that's causing basically that bridge to break down, which is kind of a network effect problem for Matrix itself. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, we were talking about Mind Test. Mind Test. Which is which is a socially multiplayer online game, and if you run it multiplayer online, and we didn't know a lot about the funding, and so we had to look some things up. And our best impression, although we just figured this out just now, is that it's volunteer based, and there's like a very very tiny you know amount of some pocket change you know sort of stuff, and various proposals about things like there was a research based educational server that was run at some point, funded by NLM Net, and it, they, people have talked about, could we do a Kickstarter, and maybe we do something, and what about a service for fu funding servers that run something, but it basically sounds like a community sort of thing, because somehow it's pretty robust after some history of just people who are passionate about it, not through the funding focus, which actually makes it relatively more sustainable, because it has no debt, and it's not sustainable in the sense of really robust like we but it's it doesn't have any super amount of baggage or anything else to kind of keep going there you know just as long as it has the pro-social energy which it apparently has so yeah it's somehow a success story uh in that, in that you, uh, maybe you could say i think the conclusion that we were about to draw was that it's sustainable because people are doing it for fun and by definition it's a game right yeah i think there's something here about um there's it's easier to maintain something that is kind of beloved within its developer community right um large enough yeah somehow yeah so there's there's kind of a, a an insularity perhaps within who's there but it means that people are very excited about it yeah and somehow apparently there was like maybe a main person who got it started yeah. but who happen to be in a certain chance to, to get it over the hump. Gotcha. And LLNet, man, they're responsible for so much right now in this space. Okay, what about your group? Uh, we, we talked about Thunderbird mm -hmm. and found out that its funding is 99% from small donors, 300,000 users contributing average of $21 a year. So we thought that was pretty sustainable as long as they retain their user base but could be vulnerable to, if their user base declines a lot, say some some other email client that has addictive features built in, attracts a lot of people away. But as long as the user base stays high, then it seems a pretty sustainable thing. So yeah, so this is a great point because you're talking about um, something that has scale, and once it has scale, can maintain itself through donations slash some kind of subscription-y type of thing. Um, kind of still leaves an open question about how do you develop that in the first place, right? Because you, you're not going to have enough people at $21 average to make much of a dent for develop. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, this group. Well, uh, we talked about safety and um, 
like I hold a space for a second. Uh, reiterate question for me. Where we're at right now. Uh, just just like an interesting point. Let's see. One of the things that I uh, like learned about it in particular was that like um, I'm, I'm stressing right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you take it. Sure. Uh, yeah. One of the things that we talked about is um, in the terms of like anti prosocial ability is that it. Uh, is somewhat open source, but it doesn't uh, take any PRs, and it doesn't uh, like they have a private issue tracker. They basically don't have a developer community, and so there isn't a sustainable uh, thing except for the people who will get paid and like work on it. Um, if we are to say that open source is like more robust and and uh, uh, like re resilient, um, yeah, because they're they're not social. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So Signal, while it has some, you know, scale in terms of the people who are using it, because it is so insular in the development team, maybe it's not like achieving some of the pro-social goals it may have. In the discussion, but I've heard that Signal had gotten a ton of U.S. military funding, and that was a thing for a while, and then it was stopped, and that's like, whoop. There's sure. quite a few funny things we could talk about. That's just a to like one thing. Just right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's there. Yeah, that as well. And yeah. that was the thing. I was like, I wasn't. I was like, didn't they get some kind of government funding? And then they looked at everyone's like, no, like not necessarily. Like yes and no, you know. So yeah, there. Is, talk about you know single payer uh, current funding status kind of thing. So. Yeah, there's the signal has uh, a lot of different interesting things about their early funding. Um, you know, Salt was saying uh, because Moxie was paid by Twitter basically to work on Signal, he could have a salary and and still be developing it. So that's another another interesting side. Okay, all the way in the back. Uh, we about the outro. Okay. <laughs> Not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> Funding uh, angle, uh, but they learned the hard way for many of us that when you do crowdfunding, you also incur operational blunt burden for fulfilling crowdfunding rewards that you now have to execute in addition to building your product and building your customer base in sustainability. Uh, which was the lesson one of the co-founders used to go start Backers Guild. It didn't exist for most of these. Uh, yeah, uh, crowdfunding. Gave them the uh, license agency, but cost them operational burden and shipping to be cheaper. Yeah, so interesting that they were able to then make something out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, how about the group that's sort of in between there? <laughs> you, yeah. Oh, okay, this group. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about Signal as well. Mm. Um, which I'm not super familiar with because I don't use it. But <laughs> But we, we, we talked about the funding and how they have a long-term one and mm -hmm. how basically if you get lucky, you can just be sustainable by having a foundation, for example. Yeah. Um, although I don't know if they do. <laughs> but, but the potential is there. If you just get lucky, you'll be sustainable. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you know the right people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, the group right behind you. Like the number one sponsor is Element, which is their hmm. flagship client. So to me, it strikes me as like you have a lot of sponsors going to support like the hype behind the idea of Matrix. So if you ask the question of whether Matrix individually as its own project is, is sustainable, I mean, I, I wonder how much it is beyond the hype that's around it right now. Um, yeah, that's my main. That element being the one sponsor is a huge thing to sponsor. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but there's a couple other, there's a couple other sponsors. One of them is Deeper, which is a subscription project, mm -hmm. and they probably won't just drop Matrix because that's a hard to go by metric. Yeah. Um, and uh, the 
whether or not the way it was funded, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. whether or not the way it was funded, it, it was uh, still social and didn't like get temporary support. Fair. <laughs> uh, behind you. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really interesting. Okay, um, I think you're the last group. Is that right? Or is there, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and it's just one small note. It's very interesting in this at selling to enterprise where um, they you will be more successful by charging. <laughs> they don't want to use a free thing because they're like, oh, will that work? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I actually use GitLab for every application, just my contribution to Fedora. Uh, and I think I, I have noticed that they, they seem like at least people with my team have noticed they started adding like various AI features to it. So that, I, I wonder if that's uh, something yeah. that could have come from more business. Because like all the businesses, these days are all like, let's go on the AI train so we don't get left behind. Sure. Uh, so I imagine that's probably something that comes from that. Oh, you've you've mentioned a word that I tried to avoid <laughs> in this talk. Uh, lots of lots of things to consider um, once we enter into that realm. Um, but thanks everyone. This is great. I learned a lot, so I really appreciate. It. Did I miss anybody? No. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thanks for coming.